To try to improve equity in corporate boardrooms, on January 1st of this year, Canada became the first global jurisdiction to require diversity disclosure beyond gender by federally incorporated public companies. Does that mean we've made great strides in getting more women and minorities into the boardroom? Let's find out from Jennifer Reynolds. She's the CEO of Toronto Finance International. Tanya Van Beesen, Executive Director of the global nonprofit Catalyst in Canada. And Paulette Senior, CEO of the Canadian Women's Foundation. And it's good to have you three back here at our table for uh, a very timely discussion the day after International Women's Day. Sheldon, can we bring this graphic up and just lay some facts here on the table? Namely, that women hold about 18% of board seats among companies disclosing this information. 18%. 24% of companies have all male boards of directors. Only 3.5% of companies have a female CEO. 3.5%. Only 4.4% of companies have a female board chair. 6.7% of disclosing companies have adopted targets for female executive officers. Let's start with a nice, neutral, open-ended question with no bias intended. Why does it matter what the gender composition of any board is? Start us off. Sure. Well, there's been study after study after study that I'm sure Tanya can cite as well by very credible folks like Credit Suisse and McKinsey that show that better gender diversity in your boardroom and your executive teams results in better financial returns. Uh, it's better governance, better risk management. So the numbers are out there. The business case has clearly been proven at this point. Um, you know, you'll have some naysayers out there who will tell you that those studies were all about correlation between gender, number of women on boards, and then actual results. But uh, you don't really need causality at the end of the day. Uh, you know, portfolio managers make decisions every day based on correlation. So the business case is there. There is no doubt about it. We're doing this because we want more profitable companies. That's what it's about. Paulette, what would you add to that? Well, beyond it being good for business, it's also just the right thing to do. You know, society is made up of many different kinds of people, all kinds of genders across the spectrum. And so it only helps to have people who are at the board table making good decisions because they see the world through different lens. Tanya, what would you add? Yeah, I mean, building on both of those, women are over 50% of the population, Steve, and that's not a new stat. <laughs> uh, in Canada, women represent 58% of university grads and have had for the last 25 years. So to bring it back to a truly Canadian example, if you were to, get, if you were going to build a Olympic quality Canadian hockey team, were you, would you just select from Western Canadian provinces? And if you did, what kind of a team would you have? And would you ever find that Sidney Crosby? So if we're not going to do that, why would we do that with the rest of the population? Let me, for argument's sake, throw a ridiculous argument back at you and I'll let you hit it out of the park, okay? It presupposes, <laughs> here, that's the setup, it presupposes that we know that half the women in this country want to be CEOs and want places on boards of directors. Yeah. Uh, and that is the case you're saying? No. Uh, in fact, uh, as Paulette said, all genders, all people, all preferences, all expectations, mm -hmm. all aspirations. But women are no less ambitious than men. So if 95% of the world's companies, 96% of the world's companies are run by men, that seems disproportionately favorable to men. We know that there are no difference in ambition levels between the genders. In which case, why are corporations doing such a bad job at the moment of promoting women to executive jobs? Well, I mean, I think it depends on the company. I think we have seen some progress in larger companies. Um, they've been at this for quite a few years now, um, and some have some very good programs uh, that are starting to work. We're seeing you know, some good sponsorship programs, for example, where we're getting senior leaders to really invest in some of the, the younger women and, and really try to bring them up through the ranks. But the reality is, if you look at the executive suite uh, of companies in Canada today, uh, there's a paltry number of women there. Uh, and to Tanya's point, we've been over 50% of the graduates for 25 mm -hmm. years. So we've had lots of time to get there. Uh, we should be there by now. If you think about you know, the number of women actually in the executive suite, it's usually one to two, yeah. if you're lucky. And they mm -hmm. tend to be uh, in roles like head of HR. And, and those are important roles. However, those roles, those people don't make it to the CEO chair. And so if we're gonna have women in the CEO chair eventually, only 4%, uh, as is the stat we have today, uh, of women are in that CEO chair. Um, we need them in those other roles, those, those, those roles where it's, uh, you're in charge of a business, you're leading a business. And that's just not happening today. We're not seeing women rise into those roles. So we really need to ask senior leaders to make that happen. It's, you know, it, the, the slogan for the UN Women um, 
International Women's Day is generation of equality. I find that sort of interesting just because I thought I was part of the generation of equality, <laughs> you know, 25 years ago when I graduated. And here we are. I guess my daughter is the generation of equality. And, and I just find that totally unacceptable. Do, do you have a really excellent handle, Paulette, on mm -hmm. why this is the way it is? You know, I, I think the intentions have been good. Um, certainly, the, the, the talking points have been clear around the desire to make this happen uh, by a number of different CEOs. But uh, beyond that, the, I think the biases have been so entrenched for such a long time as just the way to do business mm -hmm. that uh, going beyond that hasn't been the case. So there hasn't been any intentionality beyond good intentions to make it happen. I want to be really clear that I understand this. Are we saying that essentially men in decision-making roles are racist and misogynist? No. No, we're not saying that. No. So what are we saying? No. We are all biased. As humans, we are biased. So men, women, all genders, we bring bias to the table. We have cultural uh, norms that are still pushing against the advancement of women. So women, um, women take care, men take charge. That is still a very prevalent feeling in society. Women are expected to take care of the home, men go to work. Women, even the most progressive uh, countries around the world, still do two times the amount of home care than men do. So if you have to do two times the amount of home care, plus you have to have a, have a big executive job, at some point for many people, that becomes impossible. So they opt out. So until we can start to level the playing field, both at work and at home, and we see a more equitable distribution and taking on of that home and work life, it's going to be very difficult to move these numbers in a meaningful way. How are we doing relative to other countries on this? Well, if you look at the board numbers, for instance, we saw countries like the UK and Australia move much more quickly than we did. They put in place diversity disclosure for public companies uh, around, you know, how many women do you have the, in the executive suite, uh, how many women on your board, just like we've done here in Canada. And the numbers have moved tremendously there. If you look at uh, their numbers today, they're both at about 30%. Australia started at, you know, 9.5% uh, in 2012. So they've come quite a long way over that period. If you look, you know, we're at 18% today of all of our publicly listed companies. If you look at the broader private companies as well, that number might be around 20% too. So we're not stacking up that well. And if you look at countries where they've gone the quota uh, road, um, many of whom are in Europe, obviously, they're at 40% in France, for instance, or Norway. So I would say we don't compare very favorably on that front uh, overall in terms of our, our companies in Canada. It may well be, Paulette, that mm -hmm. the current prime minister's most famous quote was one of the shortest quotes he ever uttered, <laughs> which was when asked, why have you got a 50-50 cabinet? This is back in 2015 when he won his first election. Mm -hmm. You know, he said, because it's 2015. Mm -hmm. Did corporate Canada trip to that at all? No. They haven't. No, they didn't. You know, and so while the progress has been made in terms of looking at her, at having a gender parity cabinet and uh, more women, actually, uh, even though the, the margin has been small, so you have more women being, being elected. So now in, in Ottawa, we have 29% uh, of the seats uh, held by women, I think from 27%. So it's going in the right direction, although it's been somewhat glacial. Uh, but I don't think the corporations took suit. Even though it was a good example to follow, we haven't seen that happen in corporate Canada. Yeah, and I would add to that that the dynamic in Canada, too, is that we're an economy of small and medium-sized businesses. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't have a lot of big companies like we have in the U.S. And so where we're seeing those spots of, you know, Good, good things happening. Those are the big companies, but we've got a much broader economy where, to, to Paulette's point, I don't think anyone's listening on this front mm -hmm. and really trying to really trying to make progress in the vast majority of companies, unfortunately. We've essentially been talking about the private sector so far, but maybe can you, can you tell us whether leadership in the public sector is any better than it is in the private sector, on boards, in the C-suite, et cetera? Public companies? Yeah. yeah. No, 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 uh, public sector. Nonprofit. Non uh, yeah. Yeah. So uh, nonprofits are really interesting beasts yeah. because you mm -hmm. find an overrepresentation of women in the nonprofit sector at the board mm -hmm. level uh, and in the staff levels. If you look at CEOs, they are predominantly men. And if you look at the compensation of those CE male CEOs versus female CEOs, they tend to out, out earn the women. Mm -hmm. So the nonprofit sector, where you would hope to find a more pure activation of what is right and good for people actually also suffers from the same biases that we see in the corporate world. Hmm. I, I just think of our own example here. I mean, TVO is a public agency. Yeah. It's a public sector uh, organization. Uh, for the last, well, how long has it been? I think for the last 14 years, 13 years anyway, we've had a female CEO. Uh, 
we are very accustomed here to being led by CEOs. The acting CEO right now is uh, female as well. Uh, it seems to be the case that the public sector is more prepared to give women a shot at leadership roles than the private sector. Any idea why that is? Feels that way. Yeah, I mean, listen, public sector companies, if they're agencies of governments, yeah. then they tend to be under more scrutiny, right? So we have, we have new legislation in Canada now under the Canada Business Corporations Act that is looking at a broader range of representation for all people. Um, so there is greater scrutiny, which has pushed Frankly, legislation does push people along. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think we see that as a reflection in the public sector, although there is still more work to do even in the public sector. Can I get our director, Sheldon Osmond, would you mind? That's what I wanted, a, a wide shot, please, because I want to do a little, okay, show of hands here. Okay. <laughs> of the boards of your organizations, hmm. do any of you have close to gender parity at the moment? Hands up. You do. You do. I have all women. You have all women, <laughs> so that's not parity, that's in charge, okay. Uh, do you sit on boards outside your organizations? Yes. Any of you? Yes. Yep. Mm -hmm. Gender parity on those boards? No. No. For you? Uh, yes. Yes, gender parity yes. on the boards? Yes, gender parity. Mm -hmm. Are they private or public companies? Uh, Nonprofits. Nonprofits, okay, there we go again. How about for you? No. No and nonprofits. No and no. Okay. How about CEOs? CEOs? Mm. Female or male? Mix. Male. For me, it would be 50-50. For you, it's male. Yes, female. Female, mm -hmm. but again, in the nonprofit sector. Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, let me read this here. The Toronto Star did a survey a few months ago, and they found 25 among 25 of the top cultural and nonprofit organizations of the city. There was an average 40% women on those boards. Mm -hmm. So, what are they doing right that apparently others are still not doing right? Steve, those jobs are not yeah. paid. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> Those are unpaid, <laughs> volunteer, <laughs> benevolent positions, huh. yes. right? Yeah. So we have to be careful because women are overrepresented in these unpaid, unpaid. volunteer mm -hmm. roles, mm -hmm. which are wonderful roles and are hugely needed in society. But as you think about a woman's life and life cycle and her earnings over time, it is critical that women not be overrepresented in underpaid or unpaid roles because they are, in fact, the fastest growing group moving into poverty. Hmm. So here I was all excited about the fact that there I'm seemed so to be sorry. a lot of progress yeah. there, and it's not the case. <laughs> not a direct If you want to work comparison. for free, you can be overrepresented. Yes, yes. Ah, exactly. You may I'm even not. get parity. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I got it, I got it. Okay, well, let me follow up with this, uh, Paula. At the beginning of the year, the diversity disclosure laws in this country became broader. What's now required? So uh, um, uh, people from visible minority communities, uh, along with women, of course, um, people with disabilities, uh, uh, indigenous people would also be important. And what am I missing? Nope, those are the that's it. That's yep. it. Oh, that's mm -hmm. big. I and which companies, 100%. which com uh, companies are now subject to these requirements? So I think it's uh, uh, corporate companies at a national level uh, mm -hmm. that are subject to that as well. Yeah. Yeah. So Tanya? it's all it's all companies that are regulated under the Canada Business Corporations Act. Yeah. So everyone that falls under that act, which is about two hundred thirty-five thousand companies across the country, mm -hmm. will mm -hmm. fall under that act. And to Jennifer's point, it actually captures a much broader group of companies. So not mm -hmm. just the larger mm -hmm. ones, mm -hmm. but actually ones that trade, you know, the smaller ones on the TSX as well as those trading on the venture exchange. And what mm -hmm. does it oblige these companies now to do? It it's similar to the comply or explain legislation or sorry regulation of twenty fifteen. It asks companies to declare the number of people in the mm -hmm. groups that Paulette just represented at the executive level and at the board level. And now, if they, they can And if they, so you can comply or you can explain. Yes. Mm -hmm. And my mm -hmm. guess would be that in the first couple of years, we're going to see a lot of explaining mm -hmm. because many companies are not yet ready to declare those numbers. In fact, they may not even know them because mm -hmm. they are not tracking that data. And explain to whom? Uh, so that will be reported back to the government, and I suspect the government mm -hmm. will, will make that, will have a mechanism to make that information public to the general public. I mean, the, the idea, obviously, mm -hmm. is it, it's, it's a shaming game, Maybe right? Shame if if you're going to yeah. mm -hmm. get your numbers out there, they're not going to look good. Uh, mm -hmm. Hopefully, that will cause people to do something about it. Um, I think the question is, is do those companies, do the boards care? Uh, if, if their numbers aren't good, are the people on that board really going to care? Uh, so that's the question. I don't think we'll see a lot of movement, quite frankly, uh, for the first couple of years. I think until, you know, you've got a board that cares, you have shareholders, you've got some sort of public outcry that this is not acceptable to Canadians, uh, I don't think we're going to see a, a lot of movement here. Um, clearly, it's unacceptable to me and to 
the other women at this table. Mm -hmm. uh, the question is how do we represent the broader society right now, that it's really critically important to everyone else, that women are in leadership roles in the economy. Do you think boards don't care? Uh, I think some do, and I think some don't. They haven't frankly. yet. <laughs> we, haven't, we haven't seen a groundswell of activity across the economy. Uh, and, and I think the question we have to ask ourselves, you know, I, I was talking earlier about the business case and why it's just good for returns, and that's why a board member should care. But, you know, if you're a female in, in Canada, you should care because we're not in leadership roles in the economy, which means we're not actually getting to make decisions which impact all of our lives, mm -hmm. which impacts the jobs that we have, the, which impact our children, uh, which impact the environment, uh, you know, where we're going as a country. Uh, and, and that... You know, that's unacceptable to me personally. I think that we need women in, in some of those seats. And not that we don't need men there, but we need equal we need representation. Women. And we need diversity represented yeah. as well. Yeah. So right across the board, because sometimes when we talk about women, you usually find little minorities are left out, people with disabilities are left out, indigenous people are left out. So we really need to be more actively engaged across the board in terms of diversity. How about shareholders? Do the shareholders care? So I think this is a really That's interesting yeah. point, Steve, because so Catalyst just released a report last week, and I would invite you to have a look at it, that does show progress. So among the 250 largest companies in this country, board representation, we are at 27.6%. To Jennifer's point, big companies are making change. Part of the reason for that is because investors do care. Mm -hmm. And it is less about the individual you and me investor who has become who not, not that vocal. It is about big organizations like BlackRock. So Larry Fink has been very vocal on this mm -hmm. issue. It is organizations like CPPIB and Ontario Teachers and Canada OMERS. Pension board investment. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Large investors that have a lot of money to throw around who are tired of waiting for companies who are not moving on this diversity question. Let me read this, and Sheldon, if you wouldn't mind bringing this graphic up, and I'll read it out loud for those listening on podcast. In Canada, the number of S&P TSX Composite Index directors who are ethnic minorities remains low. In 2018, Canadian citizens who were visible minorities made up 19% of the Canadian population, but only accounted for 5% of TSX Index directors. Though companies are not required to disclose the percentage of Indigenous people on their boards, a 2017 report by the Canadian Board Diversity Council found that Indigenous people hold 1% of board seats in Canada's top 500 companies. There is no specific disclosure for Canadians with disabilities on boards. And that comes from, yes, the former Governor General, David and Sharon Johnson Center for Corporate Governance Innovation at the Rotman School. Why do... Um, okay, start us off here, Paulette. Why do people of colour, Indigenous people... Uh, disabled people, LGBTQ people, why do they tend to be excluded from much of this? Well, isn't that the ultimate question when it comes to deeper understanding of diversity? You know, um, we, we live in a society where there has been uh, structural discrimination. Um, and so it's no surprise that this is reflected everywhere, including uh, on boards. You know, so, so we have a particular issue to overcome beyond gender, uh, as well as inclusive of gender, you know? So uh, I think it's important that as we think about gender and, and the government starts to look at this much more closely and us as organizations and individuals who've been working on this issue, that we need to speak about gender in terms of intersectionalities as well. So not just in terms of uh, one kind of person, but also think about it in terms of how can we work together to actually reduce the multiples of biases that exist uh, that prevents us from being able to move forward, particularly with this issue of, uh, of diversity on boards. Jennifer, is it possible to solve all of these problems at once? <laughs> in other words, it may well be that corporate Canada thinks to itself, okay, let's just tackle the the women representation mm -hmm. issue mm -hmm. first, once we've made enough progress on that, then we can deal with all of these other groups as well. That may be their thinking. Can you do it all at once? Yeah, and that's a great question because there was a, a lot of dialogue about this and debate about this when, we when they first looked at diversity disclosure, gender diversity disclosure. And the question that many came back and said, well, why isn't it all diversity? Why mm -hmm. should it just be women? And, mm -hmm. and the argument back is that women are 50% of the population. Um, we really need to, if we can't crack that nut, why don't we start with that? Let's crack that nut and then let's move on to broader diversity. The other thing is that, you know, I think if you're doing really good things around gender diversity and instituting policy 
policies and companies that break down biases, it tends to have a, a good effect overall, generally, I think. And, and hopefully the feeling was that it would ripple through and, and impact overall diversity. Um, I think the feeling it has changed now. I think that people are wanting to focus on broader diversity and not just gender today. Uh, and I do think that's important, because if you think about Canada, incredibly diverse um, society, and immigration is absolutely a part of our economic strategy going forward. And so if we're going to welcome people into our country, um, you can't say, yeah, it's great if you're in these parts of the economy, but you can't be in leadership roles right. in the economy. Uh, so and we've how got to does, change. How does someone like me split myself? Right. <laughs> yeah. right? right? Because as I are walk through a door, I walk mm -hmm. through right. a door with my womanhood mm -hmm. and my racial identity at yeah. the same time. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's you know the the notion that you can move forward with women first actually leaves so many other diversities out the door, which means I will never get in the door. Yeah, and I, I think the other you know the dialogue also today talks a lot more about inclusion mm -hmm. and not just we used to just talk diversity, right? And mm -hmm. now we talk inclusion. And so mm -hmm. if those those environments are truly inclusive, they're going to be inclusive not just to women and men, they're mm -hmm. inclusive to everything we bring to work. So is the lesson here, it's, it's all one big large project. You can't just... It needs it, to be one big large project. And, yeah. and progressive companies understand that now and they actually have strategies in place to look at all of these differences and the intersectionalities of individuals, as Paulette said, you know, we're not one thing. No human is just one thing. And so we have to think of people as layered. And, and so organizations that are really trying to tackle this are looking not just at gender. And frankly, gender is not a binary discussion anymore either. So they're not. looking at all genders. They're looking at all yeah. races and ethnicities, physical abilities, all of these pieces put together. And why is that important, Steve? I mean, even an update from those numbers. Today, 21% of the Canadian population identifies as visible minority. In Toronto alone, 52% mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. Torontonians identify as people of colour. These are huge engines to our workforce. And, and don't think of these people as they're all immigrants. Many of these people were born and raised in Canada. They're Absolutely. your neighbours, they're your friends, they're your colleagues, they're the people you went to school with, right? These are engines of our economy and as Jennifer said they have to be able to participate fully in the same way that I expect to participate fully. Let me at the risk of being a smart aleck here I'm really not mm -hmm. trying to be but Paulette <laughs> when you use a word like intersectionality mm -hmm. you do understand that for a I don't know how broad a swath but let's just say for some of the population right. That's that is a what? Yeah, what does yeah, that mean? Yeah. What the hell are we talking it about? It is a complex. And they go to sleep when you use complex. a word like that. <laughs> concept right. that you could actually teach an entire year university course on, right? So I understand that, but it's, it's the word that we use to really um, try and explain a very complex issue. And what it really means is exactly what Tanya just talked about, right? So we're not binary. And so if policies are introduced uh, without having a gender-based analysis, for example, on it, then what you end up uh, doing is that you you don't understand the impact on people with disabilities mm -hmm. if you don't consider them as you as you as you uh, as you establish or put in place policies right so it's a, really about understanding the, the the different identities and and realities of people's lives and knowing that uh, when you institute policies you really have to think about how is that going to impact so-and-so? How is that going to impact someone from this community? How is that going to impact someone who uh, doesn't, whose la first language is not English? Mm. You know, so I think it's important to think about all of those identities as you, as you go through. So it's, that's intersectionality. And, it. and it really is an intelligent approach to how we create policies, right? How we live as human beings. And how we design products. I mean, Steve, think about the soap dispenser now that you have to stick your hand underneath <laughs> and, you know, uh, the original soap dispensers, which was, were developed only a few years ago, did not recognize a dark hand. So would not dispense to a dark hand. I didn't know that. Really? Yeah. There are oh, many, nice many, too. many <laughs> examples like that in the world of products that were developed with one user in mind mm -hmm. and became completely ineffective for great swaths of the population. That's the kind of thing we need to, we need to integrate a much broader lens into policy design, product design, service design, so that it, that it actually works for the population you represent. Did that ever happen to you? Uh, now I'm wondering. <laughs> I don't know. I'm trying to, I thought it was just out of dispense. Okay. <laughs> just out okay. of soap. <laughs> All right. In which case, as we consider this going forward, and Jennifer, start us off here, solutions. What's the best way to go, carrot or stick? 
It's a great question. Uh, I think it's a little bit of both. And, you know, I have my days where, you know, I'm tired and this diversity <laughs> disclosure is not working fast enough for me, let me tell you. Um, but I do think we need to encourage people to do the good things, too. Um, the one thing that I do absolutely advocate for is we need targets. And whenever I say the word targets mm -hmm. and others do, people hear quotas in mm -hmm. their head. They think we're going to start putting unqualified people into seats. We need targets. Targets are part of the business that's what we do in business. We set targets for every strategic objective. We strive towards it. Sometimes we make it, sometimes we don't. And, and then if we didn't, we figure out why we didn't and then we fix it. So uh, as, as you noted earlier, not a lot of companies have targets, despite the fact that the disclosure has asked people to say, do you have targets? Most have said um, they've gone silent or they said we don't have targets. Uh, they're very uncomfortable putting targets out there. But I don't think we'll get there unless we have targets. And yes, that's going to be embarrassing for some because they're not going to hit them, and they're going to have to explain why. But that's just the life of being a CEO, basically. Tanya, targets or quotas? Both work is mm -hmm. the reality. Both work. We've seen le uh, qu mm -hmm. legislated quotas in Europe that clearly work and that have driven change. Uh, we've also got great examples in Canada where targets work. You know, the banks are a great example. But I would also pull out another example from an industry you might not expect, which is Enbridge in the oil and gas sector. They set very clear targets for women at the board level, and they're at 45%, hmm. right? And as Jennifer said, you set a target, you may not meet it every year, you diagnose, you evaluate, you redirect, and you figure out how to get there. Their CEO is female as well, I think. No, their right? CEO is a man. Is he? But that's okay. Well, and it's it. possible. Yeah. There's yeah, one there in it. <laughs> yeah, there is one woman CEO in the oil and gas sector or of, of the okay. larger companies. Okay. But nonetheless, they both work. Uh, it's a question of how much intentionality you have behind a target and how much you're actually driven to hold yourself to progress, measure progress, uh, and figure out, if you don't hit it, what you're going to do to get there. Hmm. And, and I think intentionality is all about putting that in people's performance goals. Yes. Right? So mm -hmm. making sure that those at the top who are responsible for delivering on this have it as part of their performance goals and part of how much they actually get in terms of increases every year. Right? Do you worry about whether or not a woman who is appointed to a CEO's position or to a board of director position, uh, how much they have to deal with the issue of, well, you're just there to fill a target or you're just there to fill a quota? Well, unfortunately for CEOs, that's the first thing people, that's the first observation because there's so few female CEOs mm -hmm. that comes up right away mm -hmm. the minute there's an appointment. Um, in terms of the board, this whole argument of we can't find women of merit for board positions in Canada is just a joke. There are so many qualified women out there. So if people are saying that, then that's just a case of, of, of bias uh, mm. or chauvinism, whatever you want to call it. Uh, there are lots of qualified women out there. And I think we really have to get over that. Because the minute you put a woman on the board, she's going to prove that she's qualified. And everybody around that board table is then going to understand that she's very qualified and that whole argument goes away. The other thing that I will say is, that, you know, the, the um, quota issue, this always comes up when you talk about quotas, right? Mm -hmm. Well, that's going to result in all these unqualified women getting onto boards, obviously. Mm -hmm. Um, the reality is, is if you talk to women who are on boards in Europe where there are quotas, they'll tell you the issue went away because once there was 40% at the table or whatever the number was, um, men, you know, these women proved themselves and the men at the table all of a sudden understood that they had some very qualified hmm. partners at the board table with them. I can't remember which politician said it, but, but one, <laughs> one smart female politician said once upon a time, you know, what's wrong with putting a few unqualified female politicians in those places. We've had plenty of unqualified men doing these <laughs> yeah. jobs forever. Yeah. <laughs> um, how do you bring, Paulette, how do you bring women along so that they can be seen as viable candidates for senior roles in organizations? Well, first, let me just say, I think there are many qualified women out there. Mm -hmm. um, but we also do need to address the issue of some women not seeing themselves as being in those roles, exactly. you know? And you know, particularly when you think of girls growing up and being socialized in this society where they're not seeing themselves as prime minister, or as uh, CEOs and heads of large or uh, even medium-sized corporations. So, uh, you know, I think there are a number of things that, that we can do. At the Kenya Women's Foundation, we actually have... Uh, have done programs to promote uh, leadership, both in girls and young women and women. So whether it's a in leadership institute that we've created or whether it's uh, programs to empower girls to see themselves as leaders, mm -hmm. I think it's important. And sometimes you just need to see it to be it. I, we've got about a minute left here, Tanya. Let me ask you about that. It's well known in politics that if you want a man to run, you've got to ask him once. Yeah. If you want a woman to run for office, you've got to ask her between three and seven times before she'll entertain the idea. Yeah. What do we do about that? Same dynamic in corporate world. Yeah. But part of what we need to do is we need to start earlier with our young women. Mm -hmm. Girls are socialized to be perfect. 
boys can fall, they can get dirty. We, we celebrate that, we laugh at that. We, girls are socialized to be perfect. That need to be perfect permeates all areas of their lives, our lives, as we grow older. So we need to start intervening earlier on. But to Paulette's point, you need to see it to be it. We need more role models, mm -hmm. representation matters. We need to see more women in leadership positions. I'm not worried about the backlash against women in senior roles. I'm way more worried about other things. We need more women in senior roles. We need more people of color in senior roles because without that, we will never fix this problem. You distressed to see three septuagenarian men running for president right now? <laughs> uh, it is stunning. It oh. is, where did all the women go? It is stunning. Where did all, where did all the people of color go? Well, I mean, I'm not an American, I don't have to vote, but I'm distressed at what <laughs> we're left with. That's for our next show. That's Tanya Van Beesem. She's from Catalyst Canada. We also thank Jennifer Reynolds from the Toronto Finance International Group and Paulette Senior from the Canadian Women's Foundation for joining us here on TVO tonight. Thanks, Thanks so much, you. everybody. Thank you. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.